Uh, hello, folks, and, and welcome. Um, folks are still coming in right now. Um, this is a, a panel today on uh, dams and aquatic connectivity, looking at ecosystems, communities, energy, and infrastructure, and trying to think about uh, implications and solutions, et cetera. Um, my name is Steve Bird. I'm an associate professor of political science at Clarkson, and I do uh, a lot of work in environmental policy, and I also help run our Adirondack semester at Clarkson. And um, the uh, and I also, importantly, sit on the board of directors uh, for the Adirondack Research Consortium, uh, which is uh, presenting and sponsoring this set of panels uh, throughout March. This is our substitution for, uh, for the conferences that we normally hold throughout the year. Um, and a great thanks goes out to, uh, to Mel Johnson, uh, who has been organizing these panels, uh, just doing heroic duty, duty and Dan Fitz, our, our president, um, and the rest of the board for uh, helping to put this together. I'm really excited about this uh, presentation and we have three presentations, which will run approximately 10 to 12 minutes each. Uh, focusing on different aspects and, and areas. Uh, and I'm going to introduce each of our panelists as we go. Uh, so uh, without further ado, to be quick on time. Oh, and uh, lo quick logistics. Um, the attendees, of which there are over 80 of you, um, there are two components here. There's a Q&A, a question and answer part of Zoom. If you have a question that you want the panelists to answer, we'll do our best to get to them all. Put your questions in there. If you just have a quick comment, you can throw that into the chat. Um, and attendees are, are muted. Uh, and we will, do, we will do our best to uh, attend to as many of the questions as possible. So we're going to start uh, with, with Steve Langdon. Um, and bear with me here. Uh, Steve is a, co a colleague and uh, he's director of the Shingle Shanty Preserve and Research Station. He's also a consulting ecologist with Borealis Consulting LLC. And he is an adjunct instructor uh, for us at Clarkson uh, in the Adirondack semester. He has a master's of science degree in ecology from the SUNY College of ESF, uh, Environmental Science and Forestry. And his research focuses primarily on peatland community ecology. Um, he grew up in the North Country, lives in Saranac Lake um, with his wife and two sons. And so with that, Steve, uh, we're going to bounce to you and you are on mute. Unmute. There we go. There we Can go. you hear me now? All right. Now let me share my screen. Okay. And put this in presentation mode. There we go. All right. Can you guys see that all right? Perfect. And you can hear me okay, too? Yeah. Okay, Speak up good. as much so, as you can. Yeah, we will do. So my name is, I'm Steve Langdon. I'm the director of Shingle Shanty Preserve and Research Station. That's a, it's a 15,000 acre biological field research station with one employee, me, and uh, we, we do all kinds of different work over in the Western Adirondacks. It's actually in the uh, in the very top of the Black River watershed, kind of on the divide between the Black and the St. Re Regis River watershed. I'm sorry, the, the Black and the Racket River watershed. Um, I'm also an instructor for Clarkson University's Adirondack semester, and I really enjoy that class. It's a high point. So students at a very complicated uh, multidisciplinary pro project and try to figure out some stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am not a fisheries biologist and I'm not a stream ecologist. I work in these uh, big Adirondack peatlands and really I do community ecology work and I work with principally with vegetation, but I've done some work with the bird communities that are distributed in these boreal peatland ecosystems. And these are by nature isolated from 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 hydrology from rivers that's how they form they they are wet but they don't uh no no water really flows in or out of them to speak of so if you'll indulge me what i thought i'd do is sort of step away step out of my science shoes into my you know uh north country 
resident shoes and tell you a story with aquatic connectivity. And it's a story that I've heard from my great, great uncle, Albert Hager, who's a dairy farmer. He spent his entire 95 years directly on the shore of Lake Champlain. Um, uh, our family's been there for, for a long time. But, uh, and, and the charismatic megafauna isn't this beautiful Holstein heifer that won a prize at the county fair in like 1950. My cousin shared this photo with me. It was about a story that he read to me out of a newspaper when I was 12 years old when I visited him. And it was from the Plattsburgh Sentinel, September 21st, 1894. And it's account of, of his father, my great, great grandfather, seeing the Lake Champlain sea serpent. And <laughs> They watched it come up out of the shore at night. This big thing came up out of the shore at night. They ran home to, I think, get a rifle. And they, they get, when they got back, it was gone, but it made this big commotion. And I remember him reading the very last line, lines of this article in this 1894 Plattsburgh Sentinel newspaper, which is that it is a species of serpent doesn't follow. It may be more of the nature of a seal or a sea lion. Now that sat with me for quite a long time, and, and uh, about 15 years later, when I was in my late 20s, I read George Perkins Marsh's Man and Nature, which is an incredible book um, from the 1860s about, it's about the Mediterranean Basin and the Lake Cham and the Champlain Valley, oddly. And uh, he, he references this Zadok Thompson book, The History of Vermont from 1842, which gives an account of these guys skating south of Burlington in 1810. And they discovered a living seal in a wild state, which had found its way through a crack and was crawling upon the ice. And this is the part that kind of, you know, you read with horror and a little bit of North Country pride. They took off their skates with which they attacked and killed it and drew it to shore. And uh, it goes on to say that it must have reached our lake by the way of St. Lawrence and Richelieu, but it was not, it, it wasn't ascertained whether the poor fat wanderer had lost its way or having taken a myth at society was seeking voluntary, voluntary retirement from the world of seals. Steve, can I interrupt yeah. for a brief second? Um, if you turn off your video, it's going to make the audio quality a little bit better because it seems to be freezing up a bit. Okay. So just turn your camera off and, and we'll be able to hear you better. Okay. Thank you. Yep, did that work? Okay, yep. so sorry, I'll just briefly repeat myself. You know, this, this uh, seal uh, found its way up the, the St. Lawrence and Richelieu River. And, and now the, the distribution of harbor seals is actually pretty well accounted for and documented um, in Lake Ontario and in Lake Champlain. And apparently, I, I, there's some anthropological uh, resources for this. There's a bunch of uh, First Nations languages that, that have a word for harbor seal all around Lake Ontario. And, and I don't know about Lake Champlain, but, but uh, uh, some interesting stuff. And it's pretty cool that, that, uh, that this animal was able to make its way up in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, all the way from... Uh, well, from the from the St. Lawrence Bay to Sorel, Quebec, and then up the Richelieu River, which is a pretty low gradient stream, and in the 19th century didn't have too much development on it. But in the 1930s, uh, they they expanded the canal system along the Richelieu, and they built a number of dams of of small dams not to control the hydrology of Lake Champlain, but just to, for for uh, drinking water on some of the towns along the Richelieu. And, and those mini little, which was at one time able to disperse itself all the way up the St. Lawrence and into Lake Champlain, it just couldn't do it anymore. So the cumulative effects of our land use really uh, added up to, to, to blocking this animal from getting up here. And I thought that was an interesting way to start this discussion. Now, the Adirondacks, Am I doing good on audio quality? Well enough. Well enough, good. So the Adirondacks are a super interesting place. And, and I wanna talk, of, just briefly give an overview of, of the special nature of the Adirondacks. And, and being from the North Country, I grew up in, in, inside and outside of the Adirondack Park boundary. 
And when I say the Adirondacks, I use it interchangeably with the North Country. Um, so I, I include all of all of the northern counties of of, uh, of the Adirondacks, Clinton County and Franklin County and St. Lawrence County. And, and uh, I don't sort of use that, that uh, the blue line as a boundary other than a land management boundary. So when I refer to the Adirondacks, I'm just referring to everything north, everything in the north country. Yeah, that, that elevational gradient from over 5,000 feet in elevation to 95 feet in elevation at Lake Champlain and about 150 feet elevation up at, up at Racket Point where the Racket River comes into the St. Lawrence. So much happens across that elevational gradient. It's a huge climate gradient where, where I've eaten fresh tomatoes on Thanksgiving day at my cousin's, at the, my Uncle Al's farm basically where my aunt was, was uh, growing a garden at the time. I've eaten fresh tomatoes on Thanksgiving Day on Cumberland Head, and the growing seasons that we've measured in peatlands in the Western Adirondacks are as, the length of that growing season is as little as 19 days. So really big changes in climate. There's this huge atmospheric deposition gradient where the summits of the mountains are receiving 10 times as much nitrogen deposition as the lowland areas just from, from atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. And there's another, and sulfur is cleared up a bit, but, but nitrogen's a big one. It's a, the Adirondacks are this really interesting invasive species gradient that really correlates again with elevation and our land use history. Um, all the water flows out of the Adirondacks because it's this enormous dome of Precambrian bedrock. And so it makes it a little more difficult for invasive species to come in on their own. Of course, they're transported with our recreational vehicles and, and other commerce. Um, but it's also this amazing land use and European settlement gradient where the, the Adirondacks is home to some of the, I think in terms of terrestrial communities, but it's home to some of the largest patches of old growth temperate Northern hardwood forests at this latitude around the world. And parts of it, the central Adirondacks weren't settled until the middle of the 19th century. The periphery of the North Country was settled in the 17th century or in the 18th century. And, and Montreal was settled and you're founded in the 1640s by Europeans. And the, the, uh, that land use gradient is a, is a really interesting one as we move out of as we move out, out to the periphery, things become a little more disturbed. Um, it's an amazing teaching. Uh, there's a, a ton of great teaching opportunities because all of that elevational gradients makes, makes it so that I can take my class of Adirondack semester students up to the summit of Whiteface and we can see these plants that are growing, uh, that grow there. And they grow north of the Arctic Circle some of those plants. And then we can go down to the Nature Conservancy's Boquette River Preserve just 25 miles away and a, and a mile lower in elevation and see these sycamore trees. It's one of the northernmost occurrence of sycamore trees. That is a species that grows all the way down to the panhandle of Florida. So we're, we have all of the biodiversity from the Arctic Circle to the Florida Panhandle stacked up elevationally across 25 miles. And I think that's an incredibly cool feature. And of course the water that flows down from these upper elevations, I, I wish I knew more about it. I hope to learn more about the, the fisheries biology in, the, in these systems and, and how it's all affected. So it's a super interesting place just for it, its diversity. This is characteristic of what we call the boreal temperate ecotone where the boreal habitats and and temperate habitats just are completely overlapping. Now I'm a peatland ecologist so I, so I'm looking at wetlands all the time thinking about the ways in which our inherited human infrastructure affects these systems and I'm just going to offer a couple pictures before I close things out of, of of examples of the way I think about the effect of culverts and dams on wetlands, mostly on peatlands. So here we have a, we're on 
Route 30, just south of Paul Smith's. And we have the road itself is essentially functioning as an impoundment. And we put, we have one culvert in, uh, along this entire stretch of road and the beaver are like, yeah, we can get a big bang for our buck if we just plug this culvert. And they did, they did so and they wrecked, they killed this Northern white cedar uh, wetland, which is actually a pretty rare, relatively rarish community within peatlands in the Adirondacks. Um, and then DOT tore out the, the, the obstructed, the obstruction from the culvert and built a beaver deceiver and everything's coming back as, as tamarack in here. Big change, it doesn't look like a big change because it's remaining a wetland, but it's a really big change in biodiversity and floristic biodiversity of these sites. There's one example. Here's another great example that I love and Jerry Jenkins turned me on to, to this spot. Here's a railroad grade south of Tupper Lake. Uh, this is Hitchens Pond. And that railroad grade also functions as a hydrologic, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impoundment essentially. It's a, it, it stops the hydrologic movement from the, from the uphill side of this railroad grade to the downhill side. And you can see the effect over the 120 years, 130 years since the railroad was put in where trees are really encroaching on one side of this peatland complex and not encroaching at all on the other side of the railroad grade where it remains wet. Another huge impact is damming peatlands or changing the elevation of water in damp peatlands. It's really the worst case scenario if you're thinking about carbon sequestration. Uh, it it uh, produces, when you flood these systems, they lose a lot of they produce a lot of methane, a lot of carbon is lost by dissolved organic carbon. These are big mats of partially decomposed peat that have become so sick that they've actually floated up to the surface. And it's a huge area uh, for mercury methylization when you flood these peatlands. So I'm going to stop there with my stories and speculation and just say that, you know, these aquatic ecosystems provide incredibly valuable ecosystem services and economic, those are economic services. Uh, our inherited transportation infrastructure is fragments these systems and understanding the ways in which it fragments these systems is still part of our, our, our story. And I think Michelle and Tony are going to talk about very specific parts of that. And, uh, you know, my, I keep asking myself the question, what are the opportunities for restoration of aquatic connectivity and really the natural hydrology of wetlands? So I'll just say thanks. And I'm going to put up my, uh, my seal and cow photo there at, at the end. And I'll, I'll pass it on to somebody else. That's great, Steve. Thanks so much. Um, I uh, really appreciated that. We're going to switch gears now to uh, to Tony David. Uh, Mr. Tony David is a member of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe uh, and has First Nation status in Canada. And he's director of the St. Regis uh, Environment Div Division, charged with natural resource management, restoration, and regulatory programs on the tribal uh, on the tribal territory. And in 2016. He completed a seven-year project to decommission and remove the Hogansburg Dam just north of the Adirondack Park. It was the first impassable barrier to fish on the St. Regis River. And this project returned lands to the tribe, exemplified its sovereign right <coughs> to manage tribal resources, and reconnected 555 miles of habitat with the St. Lawrence River. Um, and the US EPA presented Mr. David with the Environmental Champion Award, which is the highest recognition the agency presents to the public for his work on the Hogansburg Dam. In 2017, he was appointed to the International Joint Commission, which oversees international regulations for Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. He received his Master of Professional Studies from Cornell and a BA in Environmental Studies from SUNY Buffalo. Uh, so Tony, uh, you are up, thank you. Okay, can um, folks see the screen presentation? It looks slide? great and we can okay. hear you well. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, discussing 
um, this this project of the of the tribe was uh, incredibly important on, on a number of levels. And as Stephen, as you mentioned, it's it, it is about tribal sovereignty and, and about our ability to manage and restore our own resources. Um, but obviously, these are these are shared resources, and and a lot of times our, our goals are um, are mutual; they're aligned. Um, but this particular project, and indeed um, all complex dam removals, are really about managing risk um, because there's a lot of ways for a project like this to go sideways and you know um, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions and you know uh, there are uh, there certainly are a lot of things that could go wrong so um, just to orient ourselves ge geographically uh, St. Regis River uh, headwaters uh, actually in near Paul Smith's um, and it's a 852 square mile watershed and from, um, from there uh, to, to here, to Akwizasni, um, you get a, a sense for what the watershed looks like. Now, the areas that, um, that would be opened up by, that were opened up by the removal of the Hogansburg Dam are highlighted in green. And then the blue, the blue lines represent uh, natural barriers. So that's as you come out of the St. Lawrence Valley and into the foothills of the Adirondacks. So they're are natural barriers to fish, but all in all, um, removal of the dam um, reconnected about 555 river and stream miles of tributary habitat um, to, to reconnected with the St. Lawrence River. And so the areas that are highlighted in red um, uh, indicate uh, uh, barriers that are still there. So those are um, um, uh, culverts or road crossings. Usually most of the time they are, they are road crossings. So that's a, this is a picture of what the, the dam looked like um, back in 2016, early 2016. So it's, uh, it's a runner river dam, uh, meaning it doesn't have any storage capacity. There's the, the powerhouse uh, on the left-hand side and you see the directly adjacent to the powerhouse is this um, stop log gate section, which actually was really important for the tribe's uh, decommission and removal strategy. So, um, the, the structure was built in 1929 and it's about uh, uh, 250 feet long spillway. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was an old and dated facility and actually the, it was, um, the turbine had, had sustained some damage. So it was only operating about uh, 30 to 40% of capacity. But when the, the license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was set to expire, um, we began the process to examining, to examining alternatives, which includes uh, decommissioning and removal. Um, the stop log gate actually became an important part of our strategy because we wanted to do this in a way that would uh, result in the least amount of harm um, to the, uh, the river environment. And so uh, that, that became an, a, a really important um, structure. So a good friend of mine uh, who works for a, a state park in Western New York called Ganondagan, um, you know, that he, this quote really resonates with me is, is that, you know, the importance of, of, of place names and, and how uh, it establishes our connection with the land and with the resources. And if you look at a lot of the towns um, and around us, um, you know, most of the history focuses on the, the far right-hand column. And, you know, these are places that are named after uh, land speculators, or war heroes, or the family members of land speculators. Um, but, you know, in, in the Mohawk language, the, we had names for these places as well. And this talks about um, our connection with the land and with those resources. And, and oftentimes, the, these names um, provide is uh, like a time capsule where we could go back in time and, and, and try and understand what the resources were like. Now, immediately upstream from um, from from Akwizasne is a town called Halina, but the Mohawk word for that town is Ohekalukne, uh, from the Mohawk word for Ohekala, which means the place the salmon. So it's the place of, of salmon. Now, uh, the town of Halina looks nothing like a salmon fishery today, but it just gives an example of, of what that resource was like um, over 100 years ago but it really got us to start thinking about what the resources could be like post removal as well. Thinking beyond uh, this place as, as Hogansburg, uh, but thinking about it as what it would mean to us, to the Mohawk community 
um, with the dam removed. Um, a lot of elements within this project, as I mentioned, it's, it's about managing risk. And, you know, right now we're looking at, uh, we're watching river, river flows and river levels and, and monitoring the breakup of ice. But um, a lot of things go into project feasibility and looking at impacts to infrastructure, um, changes to the uh, hydrology uh, after removal, um, movement of sediments. Um, aquatic invasive species, you know, as we're connected to the St. Lawrence River, um, there's possibility that, that other things, unintended things could move up upstream, um, but also a tremendous amount of pu public engagement went into this project. So um, timeline, uh, we had to convince the owner to give us the project. We had to convince the federal government to allow us to remove it. We had to negotiate with the resource agencies on the, the terms of what uh, 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 the, the conditions within the permits. Uh, we had to then receive those permits, conduct the environmental review, and then complete the removal. So it was a pretty complex process, but if you really want to see the, the details of what it takes to remove a dam, particularly a, 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 an operating dam, a licensed dam, this is, uh, this is, this is more of it. Um, then just look at uh, step one in the removal, uh, isolated the work area and di diverted water through the stop like gate section that I mentioned earlier. Now, you can't start in-stream work until mid-July in the state of New York because of um, um, this, the spawning season for fish. Um, so we had to wait until the start of summer and then we directed all the water through the stop log gate section. Now this has a, a discharge capacity of about 2000 cubic uh, uh, feet per second. So if we were to get a storm during this, it's likely that the, that, that discharge capacity would be exceeded and, the, and po the, the ponds behind the dam would start to refill and actually overtop our work area. So um, time was, was critical. We really wanted to move in uh, quickly and efficiently and, and get uh, this, part, this first part of the project done. And uh, so there's a look at the stop lock gate with the gates fully, fully removed. Um, I'll just show you just a couple of seconds of what this look, the, um, the removal of the coffer dam. So this is time-lapse photography. So the spillway is gone. Uh, removing the containment, and the containment was important for uh, preventing the, the migration of pollutants from uh, from the site to the river. So it was, uh, as the previous picture showed, it was <clears throat> extremely effective, um, also extremely uh, expensive. But uh, anyway, it was it was uh, rock solid and and, and uh, containing the work area. But uh, the guys worked into the night, and the next morning I showed up on the site and snapped this picture. So that's what. The, dam, the, the, the upstream force looked like immediately following removal. So um, not a lot of sediments and, and as our studies had uh, indicated, uh, but also um, you're looking at a seven, a seven foot climb in elevation, but not, not, any, not a barrier for fish by any means. So. Uh, phase two went on to uh, remove what was left and seal up the powerhouse and then armor the powerhouse. Uh, with some with some riprap to protect it from ice flows, and that at the end of the at the end of 2016, that's what the the project looked like, fully buttoned up with um, sediment um, um, uh, stabilization completed. Um, immediate in, uh, improvement to water quality and in habitat. So some of the areas that would be dewatered because of the dam, um, even at low flow, would still have fresh water moving moving through them. So that was an improvement for. Um, for a lot of our, our, our fish species. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, because we did a, a gradual drawdown of the impoundment early in the year, it allowed for natural biostabilization. So this is the native seed bank that was um, buried, you, you, usually underwater, uh, seeing the light of day for the first time in 85 years um, and actually just naturally um, uh, regenerated. So we did go in and, and, and seed and mulch some spots that needed some additional help, but for the most part, um, this was this was native seeds. Um, removal of the dam actually improved um, flood situations for people upstream, and so under a 50-year um, a 50-year uh, storm event, um, the re the surface water elevation reduction on the right-hand side would be f uh, about four feet lower. That's with the dam removed. So, um, and uh, we actually just got a good example of that just immediately after the dam was removed and with a, a 9,000 
uh, cubic uh, feet per second event. And if the dam were in place, this water would have overtopped the banks and would have been in the school's parking lot. So, uh, you know, the bad news is the kids had to go to school on that day. Uh, but the good news is we did reduce uh, flood uh, uh, risk upstream. And I just want to mention some of the accomplishments. You know, we, we talked about uh, uh, returning land to the tribe and the importance of that. And um, also restoring fish habitat. Um, but we're, we're the first tribe to remove a federally licensed uh, dam. And this was the first uh, decommissioned removal in the state of New York. And so that was a, a pretty uh, good accomplishment. And, uh, and that's, that's what the project's gonna look, look like as soon as we get the ice break up and, and uh, the spring rains uh, start to return. So I think I'll end there, thanks. Tony, that was great. Thank you so much. The, the video shot is just really, really incredible um, that, to see how quickly that happened. Um, I'm gonna move on to our third speaker, uh, Michelle Brown. Uh, uh, Ms. Brown is a senior conservation scientist for the Nature Conservancy in New York, where she has worked for 20 years. Um, and her work focuses on the role lands and waters play in achieving climate solutions. She's a PhD candidate and Gund Institute graduate fellow at the University of Vermont. And she lives in Saranac Lake with her husband and a very mischievous puppy. Mm. Um, so I will uh, pass it on to Michelle for our, for our third panelist. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, let me see if I can get my screen going. Does that look good? Yes, it looks great and we can hear you. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, Tony and Steve provided uh, the perfect entree uh, into, into what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, about 10 years ago, the Nature Conservancy started thinking about aquatic connectivity uh, from a fish and aquatic organism perspective. Uh, it was a hot summer, fish were stressed in the warming waters, and there were several fish kills. So together with our partners, the Osceola River Association and SUNY Plattsburgh, we set out to learn about aquatic connectivity, barriers to fish passage, climate impacts, and ultimately solutions. And much like what often happens, our first major lesson came fast. Our field crews had just wrapped up their work for the summer. They were driving around the Osceola um, measuring and mapping culverts and bridges when Tropical Storm Irene struck. This devastating storm, of course, did a tremendous amount of damage. Um, a silver lining, it also prevented us with an opportunity to flip our thinking on its head. The same structures that we were focused on from a fish and wildlife perspective also negatively impact our communities and contribute to flooding. And this thinking really opened the door for us to engage um, more deeply with our communities and their concerns. Oops, sorry, there we go. So I'm, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you are familiar with the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, the focus of most of our Adirondack work to date has been in Essex County in the Osceola River watershed. And we recently launched a new partnership in the nearby Boquet River watershed. Uh, Steve described that gradient that we see um, in much of the Adirondacks. So the headwaters of these areas are largely forested, these high gradient streams that come out of the mountains and then flatten out when they hit the valley and flow into Lake Champlain, where the land use becomes more mixed and in, including agriculture. And like much of the Adirondacks, this is obviously a very rural area, resource-based economy, depending in large part on tourism like fishing. Pictured here is our native cold water trout, brook trout, the Adirondacks are one of the few places across its range that are predicted to remain cold enough to sustain natural populations in the face of climate change. So like most places, New York is facing some serious climate challenges. We've experienced four record-breaking flood events since 2011, two of which were felt deeply in this region. Uh, TNC, we commissioned a report several years ago um, that Mary Thill and Kurt Steger um, worked on. And this report um, uh, showed us a few key things. So climate predictions suggest that we will continue to face increasing temperatures, as well as increases in precipitation and the frequency of intense storms. 
This is very similar to predictions throughout the rest of the Northeast. But what this means is that our natural resources like fish populations and streams, as well as our human communities are going to face growing amounts of stress and risk. And the transportation sector in particular is one sector that has flagged climate change as a threat that they are not particularly uh, well prepared to deal with. So with more frequent intense storms, undersized road stream crossings, you know, which are carrying water underneath the network of roads that we have that crisscross the landscape. Well, these undersized crossings can become big problems for fish and wildlife, stream health, and human communities and safety. Poorly designed stream crossings are prone to clog with debris, causing flooding, requiring costly repair or replacement. They create unsafe conditions on roads, compromise the reliability of transportation networks, and fragment streams, you know, limiting fish and wildlife movement, including access to cold water refugia that is more and more important. So the adaptation solution that we are focused on is right-sizing infrastructure. So one adaptation solution to mitigate both increased temperatures and precipitation and storm changes. So what does this look like? Well, imagine you are a fish trying to access cool waters during a heat spell. With the type of crossing we're looking at, you could make your way upstream without even knowing you were crossing a road. This design is also sized to carry high water flows, which mitigate flooding, saves money on maintenance costs and avoided damages, and improves road safety. So what are we actually doing? Well, there are many aspects to our work. Uh, through interdisciplinary science, we've been trying to make the case that well-designed road stream crossings are flood resilient, improve fish habitat, and can be economical in the medium to short term. We've been developing tools to set priorities, both from an ecological and climate vulnerability perspective at regional, state, and local scales. We've been looking at um, developing funding models like the cost share model um, to help us actually get this work done on the ground. We've been implementing projects at demonstration sites while also slowly building capacity at the local and state level. And finally, we've been thinking hard about scaling. So how do you go from completing one project at a time to influencing projects across the state? I'm gonna spend just a quick minute talking about each of these components. So I've talked a bit about the co-benefits of right-sizing infrastructure. One of the most appealing things to me and meaningful things to me about this strategy is that it's as close to a win-win as in conservation that, um, that I've ever seen. And I don't say this lightly, our field is about trade-offs, but in this strategy, there are clear economic, social, and environmental benefits. However, a significant obstacle to achieving these benefits is upfront cost. Um, Jesse Levine, my colleague, did an economic assessment several years ago that suggested that right design culverts are typically 15 to 100 percent more expensive to implement, although that does vary um, tremendously. So in a state like New York, where 70 to 80 percent of New York roads are owned by towns and counties whose budgets are often really small operating uh, on a shoestring, these, these cost increases can be prohibitive. In the long term, in as short as 25 to 50 years, these structures um, are proven to be more cost effective when you factor in things like maintenance and replacement costs. And as storm events become more frequent, right size culverts will become more cost effective more frequently or more quickly. So we've also been um, thinking about tools that can help alleviate some of these challenges. So to help mitigate the upfront costs, we've been experimenting with tools like cost sharing. Every project we've completed has depended on partners and each of those partners contributes. So the Outstable River Association might provide technical expertise and project oversight. Fish and Wildlife Service might provide funding or design and engineering expertise. Towns and counties provide equipment and manpower. So it really requires um, a full group of diverse partners to advance this work. We've also been working with a regional partnership in the North um, called the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative um, or NAACC to bring tools and practitioners um, all over the 13th state um, North Atlantic region. So this group uh, is led by Scott Jackson at UMass, um, has produced common inventory tools for aquatic and terrestrial connectivity or culvert condition 
and has created a common database that uh, we have adopted in New York State. Uh, TNC is also producing uh, prioritization tools. We have new web mapping products coming out soon in the Lake Champlain Basin and Suffolk County in, in Long Island. These products um, are thinking about ecological criteria, resilience and flooding criteria, as well as transportation criteria. So all of this work um, you know, leads to implementation projects. So we're really looking for the, those sites that meet multiple co-benefits. So I wanna share two project examples with you. Um, the first is this project uh, in Wilmington. It was on a smaller tributary to the West Branch. So this is a bottomless aluminum arch. You can see the stream running through it as if there is no road there. The slope and stream bottom material are the same above and below the culvert as within the culvert. Um, interestingly, uh, the Osceola River Association in particular has been working on trying to design effective structures that are cheap and that towns can install. And this is um, a really great example of that type of project. Our second project, so this is a, um, a much bigger structure. It's a three-sided concrete box in North Elba on Roaring Brook. So you can see this structure is about three times as large as the original structure and, um, and will now allow for woody debris, cobble and boulders to flow through the structure instead of getting blocked um, by that, the two culvert um, style that, that was originally there. Um, this is a really large structure and it meets the same essential design elements as the previous example, um, but it is more expensive. It requires a construction contractor, but both of these projects opened up new habitat for fish and aquatic organisms, about seven and a half miles of new upstream habitat um, and alleviated flooding problems. So to date as a team, uh, we've been able to leverage funding as well as partnerships and lessons to accomplish 10 projects in the watershed, reconnecting over 100 stream miles, um, including providing access to 30 miles of previously inaccessible habitat. So key, some of the keys to success, um, taking the time to build meaningful partnerships across new boundaries. So thinking about bringing together transportation, disaster recovery, the environment, safety and maintenance, both in terms of partnerships and funding, uh, changing the conversation. So we needed to learn to talk about flood resilience and safety as key objectives in addition to fish habitat. Uh, it was important for us to implement projects where communities and decision makers could see what success looks like. Um, and finally, thinking holistically. So um, the, the full package of, of things that are required to, to move a strategy forward from making the case, providing those tools, implementing action, um, which brings me to my final point um, around uh, scaling. So the toughest nut for us to crack has been scaling. Um, our goal is that right-sized infrastructure becomes business as usual. And to do that, um, we have to be able to influence policy and identify other mechanisms that can have a wide reach. There are a lot of great examples of how to do this. Um, for instance, inserting language into permits from Army Corps to state agencies to, munis to municipal permits. Um, influencing disaster recovery funding, reforming local codes and standards. Um, we are working on building a statewide collaborative that mirrors the regional collaborative I mentioned earlier. Um, this steering committee made up of DEC, DOT, Federal Highways, Army Corps, TNC, Hudson River Estuary Program, Cornell. Um, that group seeks to strengthen state guidelines, provide technical resources to transportation agencies, build regional hubs of partners and experts across the state. Uh, and importantly, we're trying to position ourselves to be ready when anticipated infrastructure funding comes through. So there's a lot of work still to do, um, but we are uh, excited about where we've come from um, and what comes next. So thank you very much for having me. Great stuff, Michelle, thank you so much. Um, so uh, 
we're going to shift gears. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So there's a couple of questions in the Q&A and, and feel free folks to add them. Uh, but we have a, a, a really large amount of questions that came into us previous to the start of the session. Uh, before I do that, I want to, uh, I had one oversight and I wanted to um, uh, quickly address this. I usually like to start these sorts of sessions by thinking about the land that we all operate on. And, uh, and, and this land uh, it, implicitly, and I, it, I think it's quite important to acknowledge this, is the land on, that which we gather on is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee peoples, specifically the Gayan Gayaga, the Mohawk, and the St. Lawrence Iroquois. And I apologize for, uh, uh, for overseeing that, for forgetting to do that earlier on, uh, that this comprises pretty much all of the North Country, uh, the Northern Vermont, uh, and well into the Adirondack Park. So uh, a, a really important part of uh, when we, and how we think about this land. Um, with that, I'm going to start and by throwing out questions um, and, uh, and I will do my best uh, to get to them all. But one of the first ones we had in the emailed questions to us uh, goes as follows. With invasive species introduced in many waterways and our native brook trout being such a delicate species or fragile species, um, do we think that there will eventually be no safe haven for them within the Adirondack Park? Um, and uh, Steve, Tony, uh, Michelle, I'm throw it open to any one of you to jump in first. And Steve Langdon, you are muted and so is Michelle. Well, I, I guess I will start um, and then would certainly look to Tony and Steve to please jump in. Um, so from an invasive species perspective, um, I mean, the Adirondacks have as good a chance as anywhere um, to, uh, to have refugees um, that are safe from invasive species, given the landscape that Steve um, talked about. It's a big landscape. It's really intact. You have a lot of big uh, large resilient forests um, that work in concert with our um, wetlands and streams that run through them. Um, this resilient background um, does help um, create uh, refuges and safe spaces uh, from invasive species, um, specifically on the stream side. Um, there is work being done to identify areas where there aren't current invasive species. So for instance, from an aquatic connectivity perspective, um, there are areas um, where we know there are heritage strain brook trout um, that are hanging out in, in cold water pockets. And we wouldn't wanna do anything inadvertently to allow for non-native species um, to access places like that. So we are doing um, a fair amount of thinking about the the pros, the large pros that all of us were talking about today relative to aquatic connectivity, but also um, being aware of, um, of these, uh, these invasive free places that, that of course we wanna keep that way. Um, but Steve and Tony, any, any additions? Yeah, I, I would add, um, you know, we're not, down, we're, we're pretty far down river. Um, so we don't, we don't have much, much brook trout down here. Um, but there are other considerations which were important. And of course, um, aquatic invasive species for the St. Lawrence River include um, um, the mussels, tristinids, um, and also um, zebra, zebra mussels, um, and also, um, you know, other fish like uh, round goby. But those, those types of organisms don't migrate upstream very well. And this has been, uh, this has been well documented. So um, those are really low concerns. Other, other, other fish like common carp or um, sea lamprey, they were, they were already found upstream of the dam. So our in, um, analysis, which included um, input from Fish and Wildlife Service, just said it wasn't, wasn't expected to be much of, a, of an issue. I guess the most recent development would be the, um, we, we found the Eurasian tench, um, which actually escaped out of the Richelieu River and has made its way up to, to us now. So there's the possibility that, that if that gets established, it could move up into the St. Regis River. But, you know, again, 
um, you know, I don't, I don't expect that to have as much of a, of an impact. So always good to consider, um, do you, do your homework and, and, um, know what to, to expect following removal. Great. Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't really have much expertise in, in fisheries at all, but it is, I do find it interesting that, that a lot of the, the inherited infrastructure, I've seen some places where they, they leave, um, small culverts with, with high drop-offs just to keep out invasive fish. Um, and some of those fish dams are around. So it's, you know, it's all about our trade-offs and how we want to manage streams. So I think those, the, principally, there are a lot more benefits out of reconnecting streams, but in some cases you can leave that infrastructure in place or, or, or purposefully uh, put obstructions to, to uh, species that can, invasive species that can manage to get upstream themselves. So. Great. Um, uh, the next question actually is specific to Tony. Um, and Tony, if you could just talk briefly about how the project was funded and in terms of impounded sediment, how was that managed? And did you have concerns about contaminants at all? Okay, so um, the, the, the the funding uh, we we had established a private decommissioning fund, um, so that was it was important to have a separation between grant dollars and the private uh, dollars, because um, most grants can't be used to uh, fulfill a regulatory obligation. Um, right. So that was important for us to to maintain um, those as different uh, uh, from different funding sources. So. Um, and the other question was about sediments. We developed a sediment management plan, uh, which involves um, evaluating both quanti quantity and quality um, of the sediments. And of course, these are this is this is um, an Adirondack watershed, so we didn't expect any contaminants. And then, as for the the, the quantity of sediments, uh, we estimated there are about seventeen thousand cubic yards within the impoundment itself. And so, the plan was to do drawdowns and to flush the sediments and allow them to just naturally redistribute. And sediment transport is an, an important function within um, river systems. Um, so there's one, there's a rule of thumb that's used in that you don't wanna exceed the annual bed load trans transport in a single event. Um, so that's why we wanted to do the drawdowns and to allow those sediments to move over time. Um, but as it turned out, it really wasn't that necessary. And there, there wasn't a lot of it in, in um, of sediments in the highly erodible areas and the sediments that were up in the impoundments, um, they're there because of natural reasons and they're, they're st they stay put. So um, the system's been at, been at equilibrium and we really haven't seen um, much change with, with respect to movement of sediments. So that was, we got lucky in that respect. So not everybody was, will get lucky if they're, and, and, and depending on the project and the location, um, particularly in low gradient streams, um, in the neighboring Fort Covington, we, we on the Salmon River, uh, when that dam was breached, there was 60,000 cubic yards of material that went downstream. And it was a slug that stayed there for a number of years, but um, here we are 10 years out and a lot of that, most of that material has moved on. So, you know, these, these systems do recover, they just take time. And, um, so, and sometimes it might, you might just have to weather through some of the short-term impacts to get there. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, the next question I have concerns uh, some of these train corridors. Uh, so these older train corridors, and those have certainly been controversial at times in the Adirondacks. Um, are they still empty areas? And, and how do folks think about that? And I'll throw that one to either Steve or uh, Michelle. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, there's a couple, there, you know, there's a, throughout the North Country, there's a couple Two principal train corridors come to mind, basically Albany to Montreal for me. And then uh, a colleague, Paul Hay at SUNY ESF explained once that, that the, the development of the, the railroad from Utica to Lake Placid, the whole reason for that development, which is built by the exact same guys who built the Transcontinental Railroad, that was built because it followed the path of the glaciers. Right, it was. They tried to go straight up from Albany to the center of the Adirondacks, but they had to go over hills and over hills and stuff. So that's an so that corridor is the one that's always on my mind because it passes through these big uh, these big open peatland complexes, and and that corridor is 
uh, I understand, and I'm not sure about this, it's supposed to maintain an, or be an active railroad corridor through Tupper Lake. And then beyond Tupper Lake, it is uh, going to become a recreational trail. I think I haven't been too right. much involved in this. But, you know, all of that stuff, when you're passing, you know, when you're building a train, you're looking for the flattest path, the, the most flattest path and, and trying not to excavate stuff because that just takes a lot of material. And they passed through a lot of these big peatland complexes without putting any, uh, without thinking at all about hydro, like passing water underneath them. And so they're, imper they're impermeable surfaces. And there's a lot of examples of these systems uh, along the Utica to Lake Placid, Remsen, I think it's the Remsen line or the Utica to Lake Placid corridor that, uh, yeah, the hydrology is just, you know, altered for a long time in this un functionally unused railroad corridor. Michelle, anything to add? Yeah, I think, I think Steve said it well. I think the only thing I'll add is that um, these, these same corridors are often uh, creating flooding problems. Um, we see that certainly like south of Albany um, into, into New York City. So again, it's one of these barriers that are creating challenges um, from an environmental side um, and also a, a flood mitigation side. Is there, uh, just quickly, Michelle, is there any uh, major efforts being dealt with in terms of trying to address at least some permeability in terms of these larger scale, either rail or uh, we might also think about I-87, um, Interstate 87? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are conversations um, that, well, for 87 that have been going on, I think for decades. <laughs> And there have been some studies that have looked at the permeability of 87, um, like wildlife that is passing through some of those, um, those underpasses. Um, so I would say that, um, that it is part of the conversation. Um, these solutions can require a lot of resources, a lot of different um, coordination amongst agencies and other partners. Um, but in particular, as flooding becomes more and more of a problem and more costly in these locations, um, I, I, I think we can expect those conversations to start moving faster. Great, thanks. So the, the next, I've, I've grouped a couple of questions together, which I <clears throat> pejoratively call the dam questions. <laughs> so there's a lot of questions concerning dams. So I'm going to throw just a couple of them together. I just want folks, uh, before I do that, uh, the, the panelists have all agreed to go a little bit over time, but I'm well aware it's 1058. And uh, so if folks need to jump off. We totally understand. And thank you so much uh, for joining us. And a, and a giant thank you uh, uh, to, to Michelle, Tony, and to Steve uh, for joining us today and, uh, and for ARC and Paul Smith for helping to host all of these activities. Um, so uh, much, much appreciated before I jump into the damn questions. Um, uh, but he here we go, and they're, they're a mouthful, so you can go tight if you need to. Um, is, is hydroelectric power really a source of green energy, or do these systems disrupt the ecosystem too much? Mm. Secondly, is there any substitute for dams that can produce adequate energy since we have these dams that are harmful to the environment? Um, is it at all possible to have more hydro dams through the Adirondacks while somehow being able to minimally affect aquatic species. Um, and are, are dams overall a necessary evil for the environment in order to be able to access clean hydroelectric power? Uh, so uh, sort of an open set of questions all a little bit interrelated. Um, I welcome you to jump in. Uh, I'll keep my mouth shut. Here, I'm going to just jump in because I think I feel like the least expert person on this panel when it comes to aquatic connectivity and, and dams, but I've heard the number that there's about 600 some odd uh, dams on state land in the Adirondacks, and uh, many of them are old and probably won't be replaced. And I've wondered if there, are, you know, we have big opportunities for wetland restoration around all of these, around all of these systems over the next half century. And I think that uh, 
wetland restoration and peatland restoration, which is really a positive, but there may also be, I wish I understood micro hydro technology better where you could really get, um, I forget the terminology Tony uh, used, uh, the run of run of reach, run of river dams, where you, right. you just have, you know, like a really, a, a really uh, an, an energy production system that's, that's many, many little ones rather than these giant ones that we understand now. And I think there's, I, I understand, I've had some friends just put in some micro hydro systems on their own properties that produce a lot of energy, but there's so many obstructions to that that's really not gonna happen anytime soon, so. And they're very small. And they're very small. Power production, yeah. Uh, Tony or Michelle will wanna add anything on that. Well, as, um, as someone who sits on the board that regulates outflows from a, a massive dam that controls the outflows from Lake Ontario, you know, um, yeah, it's always, it's gonna be a mixed bag and there's gonna be pros and cons. You know, and, and dams are, are a fact of life in, in, in modern society. And, you know, we use them for um, the benefit of multiple stakeholders. Um, you know, and some of these dams come with um, um, benefits that uh, improve conditions for riparian communities. And certainly there's the demands on the grid for consistency of power production. And so that means that these things have to produce power regardless of the season and regardless of intermittency of flow. Um, so, you know, that's a really, it's, it's really hard to, to, for these systems to be dependable, um, produce 24 seven, 365, um, but also sort of adapt with the seasons or adapt with the landscape. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how that, what that means on, 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 on the a large scale, um, but certainly, as 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 Steve mentioned, you know, some of these microsystems can plug in and have very little impact. Um, but you know, there there are changes and modifications that can be made to dams to make to make them um, less of a, of an impediment, uh, more of a pass through, and whether it's uh, aquatic organisms or sediments or even um, woody material and trees and stuff. Um, but it takes a lot of, a lot of th forethought and it takes um, a lot of coordination. And actually, I think one of, one of the last few slides in Michelle's uh, presentation really resonated with me about the importance of communication and partnership. And you know, if all of us who are in this field of, uh, of, of applied science, you know, we, we all speak the same language, but um, we're not going to affect change if we're just talking to each other. We need to form partnerships with, with people who are out there doing, uh, out there on the ground. And, you know, and that means um, talking with people from the DOT and the public works so that they know, they can understand uh, where you're coming from, but also um, um, uh, vice versa. So you got, we, we all need to speak the same language and care about where each other's uh, uh, are coming from. So. Um, you know, that's, that's, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll just pass it on. I don't know if, uh, if Michelle wants to say anything. Nope. That was great, Tony. I, I agree. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions here and I think they're focused a little bit for Michelle. Um, what made the Osable replacement example less costly? Uh, and what is the DPW considering to make the bridges more affordable? Is there currently a requirement in New York for newer replacement stream costs to span the 1.2 bank full width, mm. uh, which you provided that example? Um, and can you just clarify the difference between new stream habitat and connected habitat, which I think came out of your talk? Excellent. Okay, so um, the very last one I did see in the chat, and I provided a, a response. So oh, I didn't. I'm happy to elaborate answer. further. Um, yeah. Try to keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, with respect to cost, so a lot of it has to do with size. So what we're learning is these smaller structures on smaller, um, like headwater streams or tributaries, um, that remain within the um, capacity of a local Department of Public Works to complete, certainly brings down the cost. 
Um, you know, we've been working um, in particular with the Osable River Association. Um, they've been thinking a lot about design and engineering and are there specific elements that can bring down costs. So aluminum arches are cheaper to begin with just than, um, than an alternative structure like a, um, a three-sided box. Um, before we started working on this, um, most of the, um, the partners that the towns and um, county that we've been working with were not doing three-sided structures. Um, so that was a little bit of a, of a barrier to get over and to, to get everyone comfortable and make sure these were gonna work in this region structurally, of course. Um, so through time and doing a few more projects and working with in particular um, uh, an engineering firm now several times, that has certainly reduced the cost. So that upfront learning, that upfront, these are the objectives that we're all trying to meet and here's how we might do it. Um, you know, that learning is now really um, coming to fruition in terms of being able to, to bring down those costs. Um, and then there's a certain size project that is just gonna be too big um, for that kind of model and is gonna require um, bringing in a construction firm. Um, you know, we're still uh, thinking about those design elements. We're still building that in up front, um, but those structures remain um, pretty expensive uh, um, at this point in time. But we, we are trying to think creatively always about how to, how to bring down those costs. Um, and then Stephen, I think you had one more in there that I didn't um, hit. Um, oh, what is what is the is the DPL is the DPW or any other part of New York State government considering any options to help make these sorts of crossings more affordable, whether it's bridges, culverts, or um, mm. those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean there are a couple programs um, now available. Um, there's Bridge New York and Culvert New York. Um, these provide additional funds um, for municipalities um, to apply for um, to help match um, uh, projects like this. Um, there is um, a grant program where DEC has explicitly built in aquatic connectivity um, and the way that we're doing inventory now, those scores into the award so um, rewarding projects that are going to increase connectivity for fish and wildlife and flood mitigation. Um, so there is, um, there are those kind of things happening. Um, I think where we'd like to see that kind of stuff go is like looking forward to potential infrastructure money that we um, are expecting to, to hit New York at some point in time, um, whether it's through stimulus money or um, or specific infrastructure bills. So figuring out how to incentivize that kind of money to include the types of design specifications um, that we're talking about today, these climate and fish friendly structures. Um, yeah. So. It's interesting too, I think with the passage of the um, American Rebuilds Act or whatever its proper name is um, in the one point nine trillion dollars or so of money coming in, a huge amount of which is going to be focused on infrastructure. I think there's a, I suspect there's a real window of opportunity to address these sorts of, whether it's culverts, tunnels, bridge crossings, dams, and all of these different components of infrastructure, uh, because they so tie into resiliency, um, as, as all of you emphasized in different points in different ways. Um, when thinking about these culvert crossing replacements, retrofitting, dam removal, do legacy impacts play a significant role when compared to more acute damages? So say from high flow events, from hurricanes, that sort of thing. I'm not quite sure where this question is going. Um, and then, yeah, so I don't know if, if that makes sense or if there's a, a way to address that. Does that sound good? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to propose that we um, move our questions to um, the online format so we can have our panelists answer all of the questions and um, post those on our ARC website and Facebook page to allow um, people to be done, if that sounds good for everyone. That sounds, that sounds great, Mel. 
Um, I just want to thank everyone. Stephen, you did a wonderful job monitoring. The panelists have been excellent. Um, and remind everyone to join us again next week for our talk on Adirondack hikers. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. A great thanks to Mel uh, for helping to organize this panel. And once again, a huge thanks to Tony and to Steve and to Michelle for your contributions. They are greatly appreciated. Really, um, this was fantastic. So thank you. And thanks to all our attendees, well over 110 at our height. So see you all soon. And uh, everybody, I hope you enjoy the spring weather. Take care. Thank you.